Good morning and welcome to our worship service on March the 21st, the fifth Sunday of Lent. A few announcements. Finally, spring is here. It's been a difficult winter, but we've made it through, thanks be to the Lord. And next week we'll celebrate Palm Sunday with a virtual online service, as we have been doing since January. And that day we'll mark the Lord of Life's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Good news for those of us who look for the promise of new life and the victory of Christ's resurrection. In church worship returns on April 1st with our traditional Monday Thursday communion and tenebrae service, all beginning at 7 p.m. The first Sunday morning in church service will be three days later on Easter Sunday, April 4th at 10 a.m. and will not include communion. For those of you not yet able or uh, willing and for various reasons to return to in-person worship, these services will continue to be videotaped and offered online for worship at home afterwards. And details on that will follow, so you'll know what to look for. We're very happy to welcome two new members. Janice Jackson and Jim Widener have been examined by the session and will joyfully be received into membership on Easter Sunday morning during our worship service. They're folks who need a little introduction to you. Uh, they've been very active in the life and ministry of this church for a while, and so it's with thanksgiving and gratitude that we look forward to celebrating their choice to become members of the First United Presbyterian Church of Lackamar Valley. And the annual congregational meeting has been rescheduled for Sunday, April 18th, in the sanctuary at 3 p.m. And we will hear reports from the boards and organizations, receive the new budget, and vote on nominations of new deacons and elders to their respective boards. These are the announcements for this morning, so let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship the Lord.
Let us worship God as our call to worship. We would worship in the season of Lent, a time to examine our hearts and our lives. And journey with Christ through the suffering, suffering of the world. Let us seek God with our whole hearts. And treasure God's word in our spirits. God has marked us as beloved dust. And called us together to worship. And let us pray together the prayer of invocation. Almighty, Almighty God, God, Redeemer of all who trust you, heed the cry of your people. Deliver us from the bondage of sin, that we may serve you in perfect freedom and rejoice in your unfailing love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our hymn is All People That on Earth Do Dwell. <clears throat> Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Now let us declare what we believe as we say together, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. O God, by your Spirit, tell us what we need to hear, and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The title of this morning's sermon is The God of Second Chances. A national magazine for pastors once carried a rating system for sermons, similar to the rating system that we're all familiar for with movies. It went something like this. The person who designed it was a little bit cynical. And here's the rating that he gave to various kinds of sermons. G, generally acceptable to everyone, full of inoffensive, childlike platitudes, usually described as wonderful or marvelous by those who leave the church to shake the hands of the pastor after the worship service. M, C, for more mature congregations. At times, this sermon makes the gospel relevant to today's issues. It may even contain some mild suggestions for change. And it's often described as challenging or thought-provoking, though no one intends to take any action or change any attitudes. <laughs> then there's R, definitely restricted to those not upset by the truth. This sermon tells it like it is and threatens the comfortable, most often described as disturbing or controversial, usually indicates that the preacher has an outside source of income since his job security is definitely suspect. And then the final category is X, positively limited to those who can handle explosive ideas. Mm -hmm. This sermon really socks it to them. It's the kind of sermon that landed Jeremiah in the well, got Amos run out of town, set things up for the stoning of Stephen, always described as shocking or even in poor taste. The pastor who preaches this sermon had better have his or her suitcase packed and his life insurance paid up. Well, I have to admit that I'm kind of relieved that I don't have to stand at the back of the sanctuary after this service and uh, be rated. Um, we all preachers do what they feel the Lord leads them to, and uh, that's up to the person listening uh, to rely on the Spirit to receive it in the Spirit in which it's given. So, saying that, According to this rating system, the prophet of Jeremiah was definitely an X-rated preacher. More than any other prophet, Jeremiah suffered as a result of his preaching. 
People rarely wanted to listen to his pronouncements. And no wonder. It seemed, even to Jeremiah himself, that all he ever talked about was bad news. At one point, Jeremiah cried out, Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. Well, Jeremiah came from a family of priests, and God had called him to become a prophet at a very young age, and he served God for more than 40 years. He spoke God's words through the reigns of three kings, and he witnessed the nation's destruction by the Babylonians. He's called the weeping prophet because he also wrote the book of Lamentations <coughs> after Jerusalem was destroyed, including the temple, and its people were carried off into captivity. Jeremiah was also a suffering prophet who was persecuted by kings and rejected by his own people because of his forceful condemnation of idolatry and social injustice. Eventually, according to Jewish and Christian tradition, Jeremiah was killed in Egypt by his countrymen who had fled there. God had called Jeremiah to tell it like it is to a people who had disregarded God's law. They rejected God's teaching and they suffered for it. And he suffered, Jeremiah suffered as well because of their rejection. And so it's quite refreshing to come to today's reading from Jeremiah. No fireworks, no scolding of the people of Israel. Jeremiah changes his tone completely. This passage was written during Israel's exile, and it was a very dark time in Israel's history. It's been said that the task of the prophet is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted. And Jeremiah had done his job extremely well in afflicting Israel when it was in the comfort of its sin. Now it's time for him to be the comforter during their time of exile. In fact, this section of Jeremiah is often called the Book of Consolation. The words are so beautiful and so profound that they're welcome to our ears just as they were to the ears of Jeremiah's audience. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Amazing words. God is giving the people of Israel the chance to begin again. That's the wonderful thing about God, isn't it? God is the God of second and third and even fourth chances. One night in a church service, a young woman felt the tug of the Holy Spirit on her heart, and she responded to God's call, and she accepted the Lord as her Savior. And the young woman had a very rough past involving alcohol and drugs and prostitution, but the change in her was very, very evident. And as time went by, she became a faithful member of the church and she eventually became involved in the ministry of the church with teaching children. And it wasn't very long until this completely converted young woman had caught the eye of the pastor's son. And the relationship grew, 
and they began to make plans for a wedding. And this was when the problems began. You see, about half of the church did not think that a woman with her past, uh, like she had apparently become known to the members of the congregation, that she was suitable for a pastor's son. And the church began to argue and fight about the whole thing. And so, as most churches do, they decided to have a meeting. And as the people made their arguments and the tensions increased during the evening, the meeting got completely out of hand. The young woman, as you can imagine, became extremely upset about all the things that had been brought up about her past. And as she began to cry, the pastor's son stood up to speak. He couldn't bear the pain that this was causing his fiancée and his wife to be. And so he began to speak, and his statement was this, my fiancé's past is not what is on trial here. What you are questioning is the ability of Christ to wash away our sin and make us new persons. So, does he wash away sin or not? A very, very powerful question. Does Christ wash away sin or not? If he does not, we're all in trouble, every one of us. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah, God says to us, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. God is the God of second chances. God had a contentious relationship with Israel and indeed with all of humanity. But Israel was God's chosen people. They were to be a light to the world on God's behalf. In this passage from Jeremiah, God calls himself a husband to Israel. But Israel continues to wander away from that relationship, and God has to keep tugging her back. But each time, he does bring her back. God loves Israel too much to leave her in her sin. A few years ago, best-selling author John Grisham wrote a book titled The Testament, and the key figure in the novel is a disgraced corporate attorney named Nate O'Reilly. Nate is plagued by alcoholism and abuse, drug abuse. After two failed marriages, four detox programs, and a serious bout with dengue fever, Nate acknowledges his need for God. And listen to how John Grisham describes the transformation. With both hands, he clenched the back of the pew in front of him. He repeated the list for his, of his sins, mumbling very softly every weakness and flaw and affliction and evil that plagued him. He confessed them all. In one long, glorious acknowledgement of failure, he laid himself bare before God. He held nothing back. He unloaded enough burdens to crush any three men. And when he finally finished, Nate had tears in his eyes. I'm sorry, he whispered to God. Please, please help me. As quickly as the fever left his body, he felt the baggage leave his soul. With one gentle brush of his hand, his slate had been wiped clean. He breathed a massive sigh of relief, but his pulse was racing. Now, that's a fictionalized account of a real-life experience that countless of people have experienced over the centuries since Christ came into the world. They've known their sins have been forgiven. They've found themselves made clean. And these experiences take many different forms. No two people experience with accepting the Lord as their Savior is the same. We each come from different places and our circumstances are different, 
but the end result is the same, that we are made clean. People have been able to make a new beginning, and this is the really good news for today. We do have a chance to start over, to begin again. The past is blotted out. A new covenant with God is possible, is possible for us. Pastor James Moore's father died in a car wreck when James was only 13 years old. And tragically, young Jim read about it in the newspapers before anybody could get a chance to actually tell him about it. And when he saw the picture of the smashed up car on the front page of the newspaper and read that his dad had died in the accident, he was thrust immediately and painfully into the shocked numbness of deep grief. 13 years old, and you find out that your dad died in a car accident. But one of his very first thoughts, strangely, uh, was he was guilty, he was covered with guilt, because he remembered that some months before at a family picnic, um, he'd been showing off, as 13-year-old boys will do, he was showing off with a baseball, and he flung the base baseball wildly, and it hit his dad on the hand and broke his thumb. And Jim felt so bad about that. And in his mind, he thought, what a terrible, horrible son I am. He had caused his dad great pain, and he lived with that guilt for several months after his father died. Finally, he went to his pastor and admitted these deep feelings of guilt about breaking his dad's thumb. He says he'll never forget how his pastor handled it. The pastor was so great, he said. Came around the desk uh, with tears in his eyes and he sat across from Jim and he said, now Jim, you listen to me. If your dad could come back to life for five minutes and be right here with you, and if he knew you were worried about that, what would he say to you? Jim answered, he would tell me to quit worrying about that. All right, the pastor said, then you quit worrying about that right now. Do you understand me? Yes, sir, Jim said, and he did. He knew the minister was saying to him, you are forgiven. Accept that forgiveness and make a new start with your life. Those, of course, are exactly the words that Jim Moore needed to hear. He could make a new beginning without all that guilt he was carrying around. So here's what we need to understand. Christ has made a new covenant with you and with me. I said a moment ago that a new covenant with God is possible for us. But you know, it's not really a new covenant. It's a covenant that Jeremiah foretold that and Christ made possible 2,000 years ago. Do you remember the night that Jesus was betrayed? He took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. The covenant has already been made, but many of us have not appropriated that covenant into our own lives. God said through Jeremiah, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That happens as soon as we welcome Christ into our lives. It's why we speak of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the part of the Godhead that bears witness to God's Word. It's the Spirit that put God's law in our minds and writes it on our hearts. And it happens to us the exact moment that we confess our sins, repent of those sins, and invite Christ to make a home in our hearts. Methodist Bishop William Willimon visited his mother in California and attended church with her one day. 
And that Sunday, the pastor of the church was away, so they had a guest speaker. And um, they, that guest speaker was Chuck Colson. Now, you probably remember who Chuck Colson was. Um, he was involved in the Watergate scandal with President Nixon's re-election re campaign. And for his illegal things that he did, uh, this man, one of the most trusted presidential advisors and an ex-Marine officer, was convicted of several counts of felony. He was stripped of his license to practice law and he served time in a federal prison. Well, Wilmond's mother leaned over to her son and whispered rather loudly, I haven't come here to church to listen to some jailbird preach. Well, Willeman responded, but he's had a conversion experience. He's given his life to Christ. Well, that's what they all do when they come before the parole board, she said. Well, Colson began his sermon by telling the congregation how different it was for him to be preaching before such a magnificent congregation, knowing that millions were uh, uh, watching over TV, apparently the church broadcasted services over television every week. He said the congregation that he typically preached to consisted of murderers, rapists, and thieves. And then he shocked them by asking, do you know with which group Jesus was more at home? And then he went on to attack the congregation in front of him for their materialism, their greed, and their insensitivity to the poor. Well, William Willimon's mother turned to her son at the conclusion of the service and said, I hope that he's having a good time preaching here because he'll never be invited back. <laughs> well, I don't know if Colson was ever invited back, um, but I do know that Chuck Colson is living hope that uh, he is doing what the Lord has given him the ability to do. He continues to work with prisoners and has done an amazing, an amazing job by his conversion through the power of Christ. This covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more, says the Lord. God is the God of second chances. Why don't you take the opportunity to make a new start? today. Amen. Oops. Too many papers. Joys and concerns. A happy birthday on Tuesday to Guy Salerno. Uh, let us keep our police chief and all those who serve in law enforcement public safety and emergency services in our daily prayers. And so we lift as always in prayer, Dolores and Lori, Gary and Linda and Alberta, John, Chris, Sue, Gretchen and Les, Wade and Bob and Carol, Andrea, Neil, Dory and Allie, Carol, Lauren, Yolanda, Andrea and Mary, Beth and Craig. And remember those who are still incarcerated in nursing homes and uh, places where they are still unable to be visited. So, let us look to the Lord in prayer and let us pray. Gracious Lord, you have blessed us in so many ways and so many times we've just forgotten to say thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon us day by day, week by week. We are just so used to your love for us, your care for us, that we take it for granted. And help us, Lord, to be very mindful today of the 
freedom that we have, the blessings that we have, our families, our friends, our work, our church, our community that we live in, the ability that we have to get up and get out in the morning and go to the grocery store or go to work or go to school. Lord, we thank you for that freedom and we thank you for the ability to do these things. Lord, we pray for those friends and family and neighbors that we have named, that you would be with them at this time. You know each one of their special needs, whether it's for comfort or healing or encouragement, whatever, Lord, we just pray that you would be with each one. Restore them to full health and strength. Restore them to their family if that is what is needed. Lord, we pray for our nation, for our leaders. Lord, there is so much strife and unrest and disagreement. Uh, every time we turn on the television or pick up the newspaper, there's something else that is disturbing to us with people not getting along with each other. Um, rules that are being made that we, we question, Lord, as citizens of this free country, we have that right. And yet, Lord, we just pray that you would guide our leaders every moment of the day in the decisions that are being made that affect each and every one of us. Lord, we pray for those in, who are doing your work, bringing your message to those who do not know you. We pray for their safety. We pray for the joy that will come to those who have heard you of your love for the first time and who put their trust in you. Lord, we thank you that people are being able to get vaccinated uh, to ward off the COVID-19 threat. And Lord, we just thank you for those doctors and nurses who are working overtime to get the vaccine to as many people as possible. And we thank you for those pharmaceutical companies who have come up with the vaccines that are helping so many of us. And Lord, we just pray that as we look forward to in-person worship in a couple of weeks, that you will guide us as we get the church ready, as we make preparations for getting back together, that we will do the right thing and uh, be ready to welcome each other into in-person worship again. Thank you, Lord, for these times, these past months that we've been able to worship together but separately. And we uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to have been able to do that these past weeks. And Lord, at this moment, each one of us has something on our minds and on our hearts that we need to bring to you in these moments of silent prayer. And Lord, now we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, Father who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As always, we appreciate your willingness to support the church by mailing in your offerings, dropping them off at the door, and uh, we pray that you are blessed by being able to do that. And so let us thank the Lord for your uh, support of this ministry here as we listen to the offertory. <laughs>
opportunity and the ability to return some of the goodness you've given to us in these offerings that we present to you right now. We pray that you would continue to bless us, bless this church and its ministry here in this community. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Lord, Dismiss Us With Your Blessing. <coughs> so that you may do God's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>